Good morning, St. Paul. It is wonderful to join together on this uh, solar. Woo. We're praising. So, solar Eclipse Monday for Chapel. Uh, my name is Dr. Casey Sigman, and I am the assistant professor of preaching and worship at St. Paul, and I also am the director of chapel. And today is also a very special chapel because joining us this week is our first Brady Preaching Award finalist, Levi Duggan. The Roy M. Brady Preaching Award is provided by the family of the late Reverend Roy M. Brady. The award goes to a senior who has demonstrated excellence in preaching. The preaching faculty, including lab instructors, nominate finalists each spring to preach in chapel. The recipient of the award, selected by the full faculty, will be announced on Tuesday, May 7th at 11 a.m. at the Honors and Awards Ceremony. Levi, our first finalist to preach in chapel, is the planting pastor of Sealy Community in Yukon, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Currently a commissioned elder in the United Methodist Church, he was previously a businessman and foster care director. Levi graduated from the University of Oklahoma and is finishing up in these final weeks his Master of Divinity from St. Paul School of Theology. He has five kids with his wife, Marty, in a big blended family. Though not a big sports guy, he might be obsessed with the Chiefs. These are the words that I, you know, I was given. So we want to welcome Levi uh, to this Brady Preaching Chapel. We look forward to hearing from you this morning. Please join me this morning in a call to worship. We are all reflections of the divine image. In every life, we catch a glimpse of the presence of God. Thank you for creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Our disabilities and our abilities are all gifts to the body of Christ, <coughs> necessary and irreplaceable. Thank, Thank you, you for, for creating, creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Our disabilities invite us to join with the divine in acts of creation and imagination, assisting the world in finding new ways to live and move and have being. Thank you for creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Our disabilities expand sacred space in order to enable humanity to better experience the presence of God. Thank you for creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Our disabilities strengthen the bonds of community. Thank, Thank you, you for creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Our disabilities can give those who struggle hope through our unique witness of faith. Thank, Thank you for creating us in challenging and amazing ways. Amen. And if you will rise in body and spirit to join us in singing our opening hymn. <coughs> Mysterious bread, it's an MS break. Return here with our souls to feed and to thy followers speak. Unseal the volume of thy grace by thy gospel word. Open our eyes to see thy face, our hearts to know the Lord. The communing still we mourn, till thou the veil remove. Talk with us 
us and our hearts shall burn with flames of fervent love. And kindle now the heavenly zeal and make thy mercy known. And give our God and souls to feel that God and love are You are the potter and we are the clay, shaped by your hand. <laughs> Who's doing this? Uh, you are the potter and we are the clay, the clay. shaped by your hands, glazed and, and fired in your kiln. You look upon us with delight and you perceive that which makes us irreplaceable to your life. Forgive us for seeing others as broken. Forgive us for our ableism that treats our lives as unimportant. Forgive us for our lack of imagination, our lack of affirmation, and our outright denigration of our beloved children. Give us awareness of barriers we create for others. We have been uncaring, Open our hearts to your desire for the inclusion of all. This is our humble cry to Jesus. You are precious to God. Your life has meaning and purpose to the one who is able to use all for good. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Now you too are precious to God. Your life also carries meaning and purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now change your perspective and share God's grace. If you will join me in this statement of illumination. As we use our senses in differing ways, reveal your holy word to us in transformative ways. Communicate with us intimately so that our communal faith might be strengthened and we might live more inclusively as the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, a good post-resurrection scripture for us in this no person's land between resurrection and ascension, starting in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. 
And he said to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he open to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together, and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Christ is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. All right, well, I'm excited to preach to fellow seminarians, maybe a little nervous too, but I've got some friends from Cayley Community who came to support me, so welcome to everybody who's joined. You should know this sermon is specifically targeted at you seminarian people, us weirdos that delve the scriptures. So just be ready, and I'm really glad that you're getting one more sermon in before the apocalypse. So <laughs> maybe you've sealed your salvation in this moment. You'll be the only people this Monday who can say I spent lunch listening to a sermon. <laughs> okay. Now, I have a friend who attends the church that I serve who has a child who uh, has special needs. This child is 10 years old. And the family had attended church all their lives. They're deeply faithful people. They've tried out different denominations and places of worship outside of traditional denominations. They've studied their Bible tried to live by God's will in their life, but in the 10 years that this child of theirs has been alive, not a single pastor had offered baptism for this child. Not a single Sunday school class had offered to adapt their curriculum for this child. Not a single lay leader had offered to organize respite care for this family. No one had invited this child to participate in communion. Now, certainly the churches were happy to have this family there and this child there. But because of the way they understood their scriptures and because of their normal experiences of life, they had no idea what to do with this child. So they exchanged pleasantries and the family came and went and came and went. Thankfully, landing at Cayley Community. So here's the thesis statement. Theology matters. Did you know it? When theology says that you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart before you can be saved, there's no reason to offer baptism to someone who cannot do that. When your theology says that communion is an act to be taken only for someone in a saving relationship with Christ, or else you might risk God striking you dead because your heart is not quite right, well, there's no need to offer the bread and the cup to someone with an IQ of 41. But if you believe that communion has a means of grace that can transform anybody, a form of grace that can come in all its beauty, provenient, justifying, or sanctifying, you might be a United Methodist. <laughs> and if you believe baptism is an act of God, and not of human beings, that God initiates baptism, God incorporates people into the body of Christ through baptism, that there's every reason to invite a young child with autism or Down syndrome into the blessed waters, and you might be the United Methodist. Mm -hmm. Jeff Foxworthy theology for you today. <laughs> but the Protestant theology of the last 500 years has been decidedly exclusive in these terms. It has done what the Irish poet theologian Patrick Otuma calls the colonization of a universalization of a single experience from one person. In other words, because the normative experience of a Western European educated person is to come to some degree of cognitive understanding of the gospel and profess that understanding verbally, then that would be understandable. 
that you might believe that's the only way for someone to receive salvation in Jesus Christ. If you think about it, we do this all the time, right? A good friend of mine once said, uh, because he was able to pay off his school without going into debt, that we shouldn't have student loan forgiveness. Did anybody's hair get up on their neck just now? Ooh, those fighting words, aren't they? But this is a classic case of universalizing one's own experience and using it to colonize others, right? The fact is my friend had a supportive family who guided him through finances, helped him through school, and he was well connected and got a good job out of college. Good for him, right? <laughs> but contrast his experience to mine. I'm sad to say 22 years ago in this very campus, I started music school, and the dean of the school said explicitly that we could not be successful music students if we tried to hold a job on the side. It wasn't possible, so we should take out all the student loans possible in order to allow us to focus on our studies. That was the mindset 22 years ago, right? If you're old enough, you know. But an opposite example comes from our theme today, which is what it is to really know. What it is to know God. And in that theme, how we make normative assumptions about how salvation really works. Oh, Robin's just my friend. We're good. <laughs> Even within the special needs community, we do this to each other. In the Kaylee community where I serve now, we have many children with Down syndrome, for example. And many people are led to think that one kid with Down syndrome is like all the others. But as my wife Marty likes to say, if you've met one kid with Down syndrome, you've met one kid with Down syndrome, right? Good one. The fact is that you can have a child with Down syndrome with great variation in cognitive ability. This means some people with Down syndrome will read and write, will drive a car and work a full-time job, maybe even get married and have children. But some individuals with Down syndrome, like my own son, will have lower speech intelligibility or might be non-speaking. They may never read or write or live independently. Even within the special needs community, we assume normativity. And so we might disagree about how to deal with our adult children with disabilities. Do they move into a group home? Do they live with mom and dad until mom and dad pass away? Do they live independently in an apartment? Do they get married? These are hard questions with no easy answers. But the bigger point here is that normative assumptions aren't really that helpful. Whether they're made in a community of special needs families or with student loan forgiveness or in the theological realm where we're discussing lofty issues of salvation and eternal life. Now, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, knew this intuitively. But don't get me wrong, John Wesley was decidedly Western, European, Protestant man. He still thought the normal means of salvation was through belief. And that belief was often required through cognitive understanding of some kind. But on a deeper level, if you really look at John Wesley's life, whether he intended it or not, he really turned the idea of knowing completely upside down. Think about this. Wesley knew as much as anyone could know about theology and the Bible. He was a scholar at Oxford, a missionary to the colony of Georgia, an ordained priest, and to boot, he was a PK. So he heard a lot of sermons, right? Been to a lot of Bible studies. He's literally the poster child for being an expert in the Bible. But when he came home from Georgia at age 34, he knew with a deep knowing that something was missing. Though he assented to the gospel intellectually, though he cognitively understood the very basics of the Holy Scriptures, he didn't believe he had the kind of deep knowing that he was secure in God's loving embrace. He was not confident that he was saved, so he famously said that he went to Georgia to save the native peoples, but who would save him? In other words, Wesley understood the heart of knowing was not in the head, but somewhere deep inside our experience, where words are just not enough. So when he had his famous Aldersgate experience in 1738, he would describe this deep knowing as a burning in his heart, referencing this very passage of scripture that we read today. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there are various stages of knowing in the Emmaus Road. 
In the first instance, this couple are walking along the road completely clueless that Christ is in their midst. Even as small talk begins, they have no sense that God is present with them. They're sad, they're distraught, they're angry, they're probably confused. But then another level of knowing comes into focus. Although they don't say it at the time, when they reflect back on those moments when Christ was explaining the scriptures, they recognize that their hearts were burning, coming alive, that something was going on inside of them that did not have words. They had a gut level sense that God was present. And of course, we see another level of knowing, a moment of pure understanding when Christ breaks bread and they suddenly recognize the Christ. A third level of knowing in which the heart and the mind align in what Alexander Scott might call equipoise. But interestingly and confoundingly, if you've ever meditated on this passage, Christ disappears as soon as he's recognized. And there's some significance in the disappearance of the physical manifestation of Christ once Christ is recognized. We have to ask ourselves if God is speaking through the wisdom of the writer of Luke to convey to us a way of knowing God on a deeper level than simple cognition. And the wisdom of this story has profound and precious implications for millions and millions of people in our world who have intellectual disabilities. Because the wisdom of this passage speaks to a knowing both below and beyond simple cognitive thought. You've heard it said, if you confess with your mouth, but I say to you, there are those who are not speaking in this world. You've heard it said, if you believe in your heart, but I say to you, there are those who cannot cognitively understand the history of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You've heard it said, every knee will bow, but I say to you, there are those in wheelchairs, those who have experienced amputation. You've heard the Roman road, a simple multi-step process to getting your get out of hell free card, but I say to you, not the Roman road, but the Emmaus road, where salvation is not thought about, but known in a deep place beyond human understanding. Have you considered, what if the Emmaus couple had Down syndrome? Does that change your interpretation of the story? What if they had autism? How does that look differently? It doesn't say they did or did not nor would they have had the words to say so in the first century. But what if their IQs were significantly lower or significantly higher than yours? How would that change your interpretation? Because I bet if you're like me, when you read the scriptures, you assume the people in the stories are just like you. Your IQ, your way of thinking, your way of seeing the world. But maybe the couple on the Emmaus Road were not your kind of normativity. And yet, whether they knew Christ was there or not, here is the truth. For certainly when they realized it was the Christ who was breaking bread, Christ was there. But so too, when Christ was explaining the Holy Scriptures and their hearts were burning, the Christ was there too. And certainly when they were simply walking along the road, grieving and wondering and knowing nothing, the Christ was there too. And even after understanding that Christ was present in the breaking of bread, when Christ disappears from their sight, the Christ is still there. And that is the point. It may be that you do not see Christ. It may be that you do not feel Christ. It may be that you do not understand Christ. Yet Christ is there. Christ is here. Christ is everywhere. Amen. In all things, holding all things together, and therefore it is not so important that you know Christ as it is that Christ knows you. Do not let someone tell you the gospel is a transaction, because Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. There is no more to do. Human knowing is not a salvific act. And do not let someone tell you simply because it was their experience of life that everyone should have the same experience of salvation. Don't let someone tell you, simply because they believed in their mind and said it out loud, that they're saved from damnation, that you are condemned. Fellow seminarians, weirdos, <laughs> our hermeneutic matters. 
And if you haven't spent considerable time thinking and processing how you read the scripture, you will do spiritual damage and you will commit spiritual abuse to the congregations you serve. We all have to take time and effort to understand why we interpret the scripture the way we do. Because if you're not careful and thoughtful with your hermeneutic, you'll preach a God that is either a God of hate and oppression and genocide on the one extreme, or on the other extreme, a God that is so wishy-washy liberal that God no matter represents holiness or righteousness or justice. Your hermeneutic matters. And most importantly, your hermeneutic should not be yours alone. Are you preaching the scriptures from your normative experience, or do you look for opportunities, spaces in your sermons, in your Bible studies, in your devotionals to listen to the voices of others? Are you made uncomfortable by your commentaries, by the people you listen to on podcasts? Are you stretching? Are you offering opportunities for people to ponder the power of other perspectives? Are you going to be a colonizer? Or you make every effort to avoid the colonization of normativity? Take the experience of John or Paul or Peter or Mary Magdalene or the man born blind or the woman at the well or the little girl who passed away and rose again or this couple on the road. What you'll begin to see is that every person's experience of salvation is utterly unique and shockingly the same. Because everyone's experience is individual to their social location and ability and experiences of life and trauma and joy. And yet everyone's experience is because of the Christ. Because the truth is none of us know, none of us have a full understanding of the gospel. If you do, I'd like to talk to you after chapel. We spend entire seminary classes trying to define the word gospel, don't we? Knowledge is a spectrum, and no one has perfect knowledge on this side of eternity. It is not our knowledge that saves us, it is Christ who saves us. For it is the Christ who is there at all times, in all places, who is suddenly known with deep knowing, not because we knew him, but because he knows us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, friends, fellow excellently glorious weirdos, join me in this affirmation of faith. When Caitlin gets it up on the screen, she's doing a great job. Thank you, Caitlin. They are doing a great job. Uh, we believe in a God who created everyone, everyone and called them all very, very good. No one, no one is, is created broken, defective, or unnecessary. Every life is created with sacred worth and everyone is a wondrous gift from God to the world. We believe in Jesus Christ, who is found most clearly in the lives of those who seem to be the least important to society. Jesus invites all to live their lives fully, teaching that it is our faith that makes us whole. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who calls us all to serve and not to be served, and who gives to all holy gifts for their edification of the body. The Holy Spirit cultivates the fruits of a productive life in every believer, enabling them to share with others love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. We believe that the church is the body of Christ, and every one of us has an essential part to play in the salvation of the world through its ministries of grace. Every life radiates the glory of God, and every life is a blessed gift to the world. Amen. Siblings, including our cats and our dogs, it is time to share our joys and concerns with Christ, who is... Um, all in all and with us and all. So as a community, what joys and concerns do we have to share? And as each one is shared, I invite you to join me in saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Love all in her family. 
continued prayers for Jess, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. May we pray for the people in Palestine and also in, in, in the land of Israel. Continued prayer for the people of Palestine and Israel, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Oh, oh, okay. Um, also a joy for, for Jess and her family in Sydney as they were able to extubate and she's able to respond to stimuli. So that's a huge win for them. There, there's a lot of hope, but still prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear Your our joy and prayer. I know this has been on Facebook. So um, Andy Bryan, who's been a St. Paul alum and has been extremely involved in our community, his wife, um, Aaron, has uh, been in the midst of cancer treatment and had some surgeries, lots of surgeries last week, but she is doing well. And so ongoing prayers are needed, but we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I still like that cat. I think we have to pray for it, but um, it sounds weird to ask for prayers for the Republican Party and Democrats. Um, but it, I guess we want to lift them up. For those who uh, lead our nation and make decisions on behalf of um, the citizens of this country, Lord, hear our prayer. For the many in our community who are grieving. Lord, hear our prayer. For the students who are studying and uh, attempting to wrestle through finals, uh, not stating the issues they may have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. For those in the United Methodist Church who are anxiously awaiting the general conference, preparing and, <laughs> and uncertain of what it might mean, but also looking forward to a new day rising. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. For those with appointment season anxiety and are, who are waiting just in limbo, uh, prayers for them. It's a Lord, season. It is a season. In your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. Ukraine, I heard on the news this morning that there are thousands of children who have been kidnapped by um, Russian soldiers, which I was unaware of, and that has fallen from the news cycle a little bit. So for all the people affected by a war throughout the world, but a special prayer for Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. For all the children, able and disabled, because they're under someone else's care, we pray for them. Lord, in your mercy, mercy. hear yeah. our prayer. I want to lift up all of those who truly are anxious and afraid today because of whatever religious teachings they have, and they are terrified about the end times and apocalypse. We just want to lift them up and pray for them as. That anxiety is real for them. Lord, in your mercy. I have a joy also go, I was also just gonna say, I wanna lift up all the little people who are excited to see, and I'm talking about littles, who are excited to see the eclipse today. 
um, that they would protect their eyes. And I would also uh, double down on all of us older people that we would also protect our eyes today. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I have a joy that Robin um, passed his final field test and is officially a therapy dog. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Robin. He's exhausted. <laughs> anticipating all of the the ministry that awaits robin <laughs> in your mercy here are our prayer. Prayer. <laughs> look at the light <laughs> <laughs> for those who are wrestling with coming to seminary or wrestling with their call to ministry mm -hmm. in these times mm -hmm. lord in your mercy here are our prayer Well, let us continue in the spirit of prayer, centering ourselves with our breath, remembering that the Lord Jesus Christ said to the apostles, peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. In the midst of joy and confusion, pain and grief, celebration and productivity, that peace of Christ is with us and within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you will rise in body or spirit and sing with us our closing hymn. God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. No, I, unworthy Christ in love, redeem me for his own. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. Say together. Amen. 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 Go in peace.